Okay, hello everybody, good afternoon. I'm Richard Snyder, I'm the director of the Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies here at Brown, as well as a professor of political science, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this lunchtime talk by Noel Brigden. Noel is here at the Watson Institute for International Studies as a postdoctoral fellow. Unfortunately for us, but fortunately for her, she has a great job waiting for her in September at uh, Marquette University as assistant professor of political science <clears throat> that she'll be starting, but we've been uh, lucky to have her here with us all of this year. Noel <clears throat> received her PhD in government, I guess it is, at Cornell, um, instead of political science, they call it government, uh, last year. And as you'll be hearing, she'll be discussing her doctoral dissertation, which is a book manuscript in process. And it really, it's a wonderful political ethnography. This is an example of, well, sometimes risky field work, risky for the researcher herself in some ways, but really uh, getting close to the subjects of the study and traveling with them as is fitting for a study on migration across places and borders. So it's a wonderful example of, of political ethnography and of interdisciplinary trespassing. Um, Noel is trained as a political scientist, but her method of choice, ethnography, is often associated more with anthropology and to a lesser degree sociology than with political science. And you'll see from her work that she very comfortably crosses not only international boundaries in her research, but disciplinary boundaries as well, okay? So uh, please join me in welcoming Noel Brigden to Joukowsky. Noel. Thank you very much. My name is Noel Brigden, and today I'm going to be talking about the emergence of a transnational social space along clandestine migration routes from Central America through Mexico and into the United States. Central Americans have to cross more than one border to get to the United States, undocumented. But it's not just the borders that are dangerous for the Salvadorans, Guatemalans, Hondurans, Nicaraguans, and others that make this journey. In fact, borders are just one site of policing and danger for Central American migrants. This picture, which was published by Amnesty International, show some of the common pathways that Central Americans take through Mexico. Now, the pathways stop in this picture at the U.S. border, but I don't want to give you the impression that the pathways in reality stop there. In fact, we have clandestine routes that crisscross the United States to avoid internal immigration policing. I want us to think about what the borderlands can teach us about the nation state in an age of internal immigration policing and criminal violence against migrants that spans the entirety of nation states, not just at the borders, at the geographical margins. Since 2001 in Mexico, we've seen a crackdown on, migration, on undocumented migration. And this isn't just at the borders, but at internal policing belts within the country so that you have highway checkpoints uh, that pull people from buses to interrogate them and discover their nationality. You also have raids on trains that the poorest people ride like hobos to try to get to the United States. This is a picture of one of those trains. Since 2006, we've seen an explosion of violence against these migrants crossing Mexico. The route has always been dangerous with robberies and rapes, bribes, and beatings and bandits as people have tried to make this, this passage. But since 2006, we've seen the terrain of the cartels change hands without warning, such that even the human smugglers themselves don't know who to pay in order to make it across safely. This creates danger both for migrants and their guides. We've seen the emergence of a kidnapping industry where People are kidnapped in mass and then tortured to extort money from US-based relatives, money that would have been paid 
to smugglers upon their arrival in the United States, but instead now goes to a, a kidnapper to secure their release. This picture was taken by photographer Nico Jankowski. He boarded the train in the daylight hours in Arriaga in southern Mexico in Chiapas. And this is what he found in December 2010. He disembarked from the train at nightfall. And he got back on the train at a point farther north in Oaxaca. And when he reboarded the train, can you still hear me if I walk away from the microphone? When he reboarded the train, this is what he found. In the middle of the night, first there was a migration raid. And as the migrants were fleeing from the train, one of the agents yelled out, don't worry, something else is waiting for you later. A short distance later, when the migrants snuck back onto the train, those who had evaded capture snuck back onto the train and traveled. The train was stopped a second time, and this time attacked by civilians with machetes and small arms. They were taken, they were kidnapped, we know this because some of the migrants escaped the second stop and came to a Catholic migrant shelter to report the crime. We think about 55 people may have been kidnapped that night. The Catholic migrant shelter is one of a network, a loose network, of about 50 Catholic migration shelters. Some of them are food kitchens, others provide three nights of respite for people in transit on their way to the United States. And many of these were my field sites. I visited 11. Once we start thinking about this sort of violent contestation and the policing that happens within the nation state, it poses a question. What can the experience of these migrants teach us about the tenuous relationship between national identity and territory? International relations scholarship science has generally focused on diaspora activists, collective action, purposeful resistance, and also organized crime to explain how borders continue to be trespassed despite the investment of the state to secure them. But if we follow in the footsteps of this young Salvadoran man, what we'll find is that even unchoreographed, uncoordinated, everyday practice defies both social and territorial boundaries, blurring borders. In this picture, you will see my son on the right, who had his own sort of odyssey during my field work, a transnational one. And then over here, you see a Salvadoran boy turned away from the camera. They're walking near a migrant shelter in East Oaxaca. My son is marked by cultural and racial tells as an outsider in Mexican society. When we ride the bus, Mexican migration agents look at us and know we aren't Mexican. They can tell from my very strong accent. They can tell from my physical appearance, the way we dress, and so on. But we rarely get asked for identification. I think the assumption is that we have it handy. This young man is marked in exactly the same way as an outsider. He's marked by the clothes he wears, his accent, which is a Salvadoran accent rather than a Mexican one. The words that he uses to describe various things are different than the Mexican Spanish. He doesn't know the Mexican national anthem or much about Mexican history and so on. So when he's in the migrant shelter yard and he's trying to get attention shouting, Look at me, I can speak like a Mexican. And using stereotypical, melodic Mexican accent, Mexican words. Is that better? All right. So when he's playing at being Mexican, trying to get attention for laughter, and parodying Mexican nationality for the adults around him, He's actually practicing a vital survival skill for himself and his family. If he could, if he could be just like a, act just like a Mexican and pass undetected, not only would they evade migration authorities, but they might also evade the criminal predators that hunt for migrants on their way to the 
So migration agents use a set of unreliable cultural markers to tell the difference between outsiders and insiders in Mexican society and in the United States society. Documentation is an incomplete and imperfect cultural marker to police foreigners from citizens. It's imperfect in Mexico because like in the United States, there's no law saying you have to carry around your national ID card to travel through the country. You don't need your passport to go from one state to another, just like in the United States. It's also incomplete because there are many marginalized Mexican citizens who don't interface well with their own government institutions and may not be able to obtain a birth certificate very easily and other documentation. And we've, our, our attention has been drawn to this issue in South-South Migration and International Relations by Kamal Sadiq. But Sadiq stops in talking about South-South Migration. And I would say that we see elements of this all the way through the United States as well, as we have internal immigration policing, in that even if everyone had a document, it would be imperfect as a, as a tell for nationality. Because as we know from the work of Gilroy in airports, you, the, the migration agents still have to develop filters to know which documents to scrutinize more closely as potential fakes, which people to ask for documentation, because unlike at the border where now they're stopping most everyone, at internal checkpoints you can't do that. So even, even in those situations, uh, these racial and cultural tells are used. Now, I was fascinated by how migration agents knew that someone was Salvadoran or Guatemalan and not Mexican because I couldn't necessarily hear the difference in, in many cases when native speakers could. And I kept pushing them on this when I interviewed people. Um, and I interviewed an ICE agent who had worked the borderline for a long time. And I asked him how he knew which car to stop and which person to stop and inspect. And, and you know, I'd watched all the movies, so I thought, is it that one of the cars is lower to the ground and you can see that it's carrying extra weight? And he said, no, no, no. It's about this gut feeling you get about who to stop. And I, being an academic, I got very excited. I said, oh, is that tacit knowledge? Would you call it local knowledge? You know, because these are terms that I'd heard in graduate school. And, and he said, he just laughed and he put his feet up on the table and he said, in my line of work, we call it racial profiling. And if you ask a Latino that lives between the second garrison where they do inspections inside the United States and the border zone on US territory, I think their experience would confirm this, that in fact, they are the ones who get stopped and asked for documentation. So police and criminals are harnessing these racial and cultural, cultural tells. The criminals do it too. They hunt using the exact same cultural tells that the state does when they look for kidnapping victims because they know for certain that A, the person is living outside the law to begin with, and B, they're on their way to the United States, so they probably have relatives here that we can assume have access to the funds to pay for ransom. What, what came to fascinate me was the fact that the possibility of passing, passing as Mexican, Passing as a US citizen destabilizes these tells. And when I use the, the term passing, I don't mean to, to imply that there's an underlying authentic identity that is sort of heartfelt. That I don't, don't care to get into. Uh, what I'm talking about is the outward expressions of identity. And people pass both because they're trying to deceive and they do it intentionally, but there's also a sort of passing that happens by accident. Because this is a long distance trade route sustained over time. And it becomes a focal point for a transnational cultural change. And all of these transnational tells begin to diffuse along this route, such that over time, people who live along the route and the people who pass along it begin to share a lot of qualities. So that the social boundaries between citizens and foreigners are ephemeral 
even though the markers we're trying to use to tell the difference are fixed. And in this picture, you see a, a Mexican soldier apprehending a migrant who was running from the train. All right. Now, I didn't start with these questions. I started with much more straightforward questions about smuggling routes and policing and, and social capital. And I got to these sorts of insights through a sort of inductive, ground up way. I imported a lot of the methods from the anthropology of flows into my research. And I wanted to follow the people, not just to where they were planning on going, but all the places they ended up along the way. In so doing, I ended up in a lot of places I hadn't planned for, for my academic research. So um, I conducted a series of map making workshops with young people before they made the journey from El Salvador. I asked them to imagine their route for me and draw it. And then I asked people who had returned from their journey to remember the route that they had taken and draw it. I initially thought of maps as purely geographical representations of information. But as you will see in the maps that I'm going to show you, we get something much more rich and important about the experience of the journey. I conducted participant observation as a volunteer at one of these 50 migrant shelters. I visited 11, but at one I spent a great deal of time volunteering. I only took one train ride with the migrants. I didn't think my dissertation committee wanted to pay a ransom. And, uh, <laughs> I thought one train ride was probably enough. Um, and I conducted interviews with migrants, both in El, in El Salvador, along the route through Mexico, and a few follow-up interviews in the United States as well. And what really interested me was how the social interactions of strangers in transit became both sources of information and sources of danger for people. It was necessary that they interact with people they didn't know as they cross this very dangerous social terrain. Uh, and even if you hire a smuggler, you're going to get grouped in a sort of multinational travel group with friends and potential enemies and traitors and allies. And as you're crossing, you have to negotiate all of these relationships with or without smuggler. The relationship even with your smuggler and his underlings. In this picture, we see a group of migrants um, gathering to, to get on the train. So how do they negotiate all of these social encounters with strangers? I turn to Goffman, uh, a sociologist who has a sort of um, a very elaborate and developed idea about the micro interactions uh, between strangers. And he talks about performance. And he talks about how people perform social roles both in good faith and bad. So people sometimes intentionally may deceive or perform a role, but sometimes they don't. But one distinction I want to make clear is that these performances that people have to do every day, every step they take, every encounter they have, are not ritualistic performances with set scripts, but in fact improvised performances to help them move across a terrain. And what that means is that in improvisation, you have to have a sort of irreverent leveraging of your materials at hand. If you're a migrant and you have physical materials, you might take a, a Coca-Cola bottle and fashion a sort of life vest to get across the river. But it also is a leveraging of the social materials at hand. And that has to do with the established stereotypes and roles that we can use, and the scripts associated with those, that we can use them in impromptu ways for purposes that they weren't intended. So to clarify. So there are many, many sources of scripts. Here are the, the usual suspects when we think about imagined communities. Uh, you have nationality, gender, class, religion, race, gang affiliations. All of these come with scripts that can be leveraged upon in new ways. Um, and they intersect in very interesting ways. In this picture, it's a map of a woman who had returned to El Salvador. And where you see the man and the woman holding hands at the center of her map, it was when her Mexican guy and she were speaking to a Mexican migration agent. 
and the Mexican guy did the talking for her. If the Mexican guy had been a woman and the migrant, the Salvadoran, had been a man, this might not have worked so well. But as it stood, her silence was not read as a deception or an attempt to pass as Mexican. It was read as being a bashful campesina in a particular type of rural femininity. And it wasn't noted by the migration agents who released them, convinced that, in fact, she was the man's girlfriend. But over time, because it's a strategic environment, people catch on to these types of performances. And it changes what it means to be a woman, what types of femininity are taken for granted or not. So the next woman that passes there might not be so lucky. All of these performances happen in all sorts of ways along the route. Storytelling, eavesdropping, visual clues taken in, all of this is information given off, not necessarily intentionally. But because membership information along the transnational route is so valuable, we use all of this information in all sorts of ways that way. And, and the stories that people tell and the, the performances that they have as they, as they talk to one another over time, collectively reimagine the root and the social boundaries that have been used as markers to enforce territorial boundaries. So to give an example, I think I have time for a couple more examples. Um, in the shelter, I met a man in a wheelchair. And everyone would crowd around whenever he spoke, because it was amazing to see a man in a wheelchair come out off the train. And he was the leader of his little group of travel companions, this Honduran man. And I tried to interview him, but every time I tried to interview him, a little group would gather wherever we sat. It was impossible to hide. So while I was interviewing him, a little group of people gathered around to listen. And I asked him, he, he, he'd been to the United States before, and I asked him how he did it. And he described the journey. And when we got to the border, I said, but how much did you have to pay to get across the border? Because there are special travel packages for disabled people or pregnant women or children that cost much more. And I thought this man surely had to have paid a fortune to get across the border. And he said, no, 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 I didn't pay anything. And I said, well, well, who helped you? I thought, oh, the man had a humanitarian assistant or a friend. He said, no, nobody helped me. I did it on my own. I did it all alone. And everybody in the group listening stopped. What do you mean you did it all alone? And he said, well, when he got to the river, the, the Rio Bravo, he fashioned a raft out of empty Coca-Cola bottles, a big raft. And he lifted his wheelchair onto the raft, and he went across the river. Then he rolled off of the raft on the other side, and he rolled all the way up through the desert over a hill. And when he got to the top of the hill, there was a man there in the wilderness. And the man looked at him, and he said, man, you have balls. And at this, he rolled back down the hill, you know, and he rolled all the way to the highway. And when he got to the highway, he stopped. And a bus came. And the bus opened the door, and the bus driver looked at him and said, I can't let you on. You need to wait for a disabled bus, a bus with a ramp. And the man in the wheelchair said, no problem. And he pulled himself up the bus stairs, and he pulled his, his wheelchair behind him, and he got on the bus, and he looked at me, and he said, and that's how I got to the United States. And then he, and then he performed a Christian rap you know, for all of us around, and he, he transitioned to this, this brilliant rap. And I didn't believe a word of it, but that wasn't the point. The point was that this man was reimagining his own role. He was redefining what it is to be a man, he was defining his authority for the group, his charisma, the fact that he is a man to be reckoned with and worth knowing and worth traveling with. That was his resource. And he had converted this wheelchair into a prop for that performance that rewrote the way I thought about social and physical boundaries for another human being. The stories themselves are border crossing tactics. So 
I want to tell this story about nationality in particular in three acts, in what I think gives birth to a sort of improvised transnationalism along the route during the journey. The first act we've already talked about, which is Central American migrants passing as Mexican. So I'll go quickly there. The second act is about citizens and other transients who pass as migrants. And this really surprised me. Why would you pass as the most vulnerable category along this route? And there are reasons why people do it on purpose, and there are reasons why it happens accidentally. And then finally, because I don't want to give the impression that this is a story of emancipation, that this sort of improvised transnationalism is a, a liberatory process for the migrants involved, I think it's important to emphasize that people themselves become props for state performances. And this entails a great deal of suffering. So in the first act, we've already talked a bit about it, people pass as Mexican. They're doing this to avoid police. They're doing this to avoid crime. It's facilitated by time along the route. So if you spend enough time along the route, sooner or later, you might get your accent right. You might learn which day Mother's Day is celebrated in Mexico and so on. Um, but it's bounded by race. Even though there are black people, there are white people, there are indigenous people in Mexico, the dominant racial ideology is mestizo. So if you're a black Honduran riding a bus, the quality of your performance has to be much, much better than if you look like the other people who are stereotypically associated with your nationality. In this picture, this was drawn by a Salvadoran young man who had only made it as far as Tapachula, the first major city in southern Mexico, before he was deported back. And I was asking him, how did they know you were Salvadoran? How did they pull you out of a crowd? And he said, it might be because we Salvadorans are whiter than the Mexicans. And I looked at him and I kind of shrugged. I said, well, maybe. Is there anything else you can think of? And he said, it could be because I forgot that my belt said El Salvador. <laughs> and then he smiled and laughed about it. But down to the clothes you wear, all of the, your name, certain names are more common in Central America. All of these things are used to know who you are and and where you allegedly belong. In the second act, this is what I found so counterintuitive, that people would purposely pass themselves off as migrants on the way to the United States. Mexican homeless people would try to pass themselves off as Central American to access that humanitarian aid at the Catholic relief shelters. Uh, in a more nefarious kind of performance, some people would pretend to be Central American migrants to access information for the kidnappers, to spy on their comrades and figure out who's receiving remittances from the United States. Can they get the phone number of one of their US-based relatives to make it easier to extort money? Or even to befriend them and then guide them into an ambush later on during the journey. Those were called rateros by the migrants. And one always had to be on the lookout. Smugglers would want access to the shelter as well to find clients. So they too would pretend to be Central American migrants on their way to the United States. Now, not everyone pretending to be a Central American migrant was Mexican. There were Central Americans who would pretend to be migrants. And what I mean by that is that they were no longer on their way to the United States. They'd given up or they've been distracted by other activities, maybe in the gray or black economy. Or maybe they'd come to join some of these transnational criminal gangs, the street gangs, and were entering as spies. But they were not considered migrants by the shelter staff. And every interview when they admitted someone in these shelters, they would try to look for tells, both about who was Mexican and also who wasn't migrating to the United States. Because those people that are migrating to the United States and trying to improve or better the lives of their family were deserving of this humanitarian aid. So as people spend time along the route, it would cut both ways. On the one hand, they would make Mexican social contacts, which can be very useful for surviving the journey. But on the other hand, 
They weren't anonymous anymore. And that limited the range of performances in which they could engage. And it limited their access to the humanitarian resources as well. And it made them targets by competing smugglers who, whether by mistake or because it was true, would recognize them as a potential competitor in some of these black market transactions that emerge around the route. So the longer you're around the route and the more recognizable you become, the more vulnerable you become in this sense. Anyone follow? So <laughs> smugglers will often pose as migrants for this reason. Part of the contract when you go with a smuggler is that you'll never tell who the smuggler is in the group if you're apprehended either by a competing criminal or by the authorities. The, the smugglers will pass as migrants. In this picture, it was a map of a memory of a woman from El Salvador. At some point in northern Mexico, uh, she was hidden in a hidden compartment in a banana truck when she heard the driver of the truck pulled out and shot three times. He had not paid the right territory boss to cross the territory. And it's for that reason that sometimes smugglers, even if they're of the same nationality as their clients, will pose as migrants among them. But this is all about those intentional performances. There's something that happens, a sort of social conversion or cultural conversion along the routes over time, where people sometimes not because they want to pass as a member of this vulnerable category, but because they can't help but be associated with this vulnerable category of people um, arise. This comes out of a permanent transience along the routes. You have a political economy at the local level which is oriented to the flow of people. In this picture, you see women who live in the Mexican communities along the train route rushing out to sell tamales and other food to the, to the migrants on the train. Sometimes there's more people selling food than there are migrants. Um, and they may learn to cook some of the foods that the migrants like in this com competition to cater to them. You know, so they might learn how to cook pupusas, for example. You have the sustained trade route such that Mexican, uh, you get Central American people that pass, and maybe they father Mexican citizen children. Or they're adopted as sons into Mexican families because they've passed enough times that they've made friends. Uh, they've made many, many journeys to the United States. They have comrades that are mixed, Mexican, Central American. It becomes a birthplace for new social networks. And ways of speaking, ways of dressing, even ways of social organization, like the transnational street gangs with their birthplace in Los Angeles, come to occupy this space. But all of this is not about an emancipatory story. It's not about people overcoming borders and learning to live in a sort of global society. Peter Andreas here at the Watson Institute has talked from the perspective of migrant receiving states uh, about border policing as a form of political theater for a domestic political audience. And in this, I think what's important to pay attention to is that the migrants themselves become unwilling props in this larger political theater. But it's not just receiving states that participate in the political theater of migration and borders. It's also receiving states. So you have work now growing on how deportation and repatriation are also performances of sovereignty. Sending states like Mexico and El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, they might not be able to provide the basic human security and economic conditions that would keep their people home, but at least they can provide an orderly return. And so they cooperate with receiving states and transit states to provide a return for their citizens, both those who come home live and deported and the dead bodies that come home repatriated. In August 2010, 72 migrants were discovered in a mass grave in Tamaulipas. It was the first 
of such mass graves discovered by the international media. Many more have followed. A forensic team went to work to decide who they were and what nationality they were. They were from Ecuador, Honduras, El Salvador. Some of them were never claimed. We still don't know the identities of the last few. But when the Salvadorans were returned, the dead bodies were returned to El Salvador, they came home with full honors, with caskets draped in the Salvadoran flag. And in this way, you have the state, again, reasserting its sovereignty, but again, redefining its role, not the same role we started with at the beginning of this process. In this picture, you have, this is a door in a migrant shelter in Saltillo. And here you have the pictures of missing persons, family members who have passed looking for their loved ones have posted missing per persons here. Um, and we have now, on a mass scale, uh, a, a forensic anthropology team from Argentina looking to try to identify the nationality of the people in the mass graves in Mexico, because it's believed that many of them may be migrants. But in so doing, you have civil society, the family members, and the state using the very same cultural tells that the migration police have used to identify where these bodies belong. They look at tattoos, the things they carried on them, what type of currency, in order to figure out where to search for the DNA to match these people. So you have the state, again, improvising upon these national scripts and roles to send the people back. So what are the implications for the nation state? One is that IR scholars need to pay more attention to everyday practice. And this unchoreographed resistance to borders even if Goliath defeats our Central American David, even if he never steps foot in the United States, his presence in this transnational space is transforming it and transforming the capacity of the state to police it. Number two, the deportation cycle and the birth of transnational homelessness. As you send people back, but they cannot stay in Central America, because the very reasons that pushed them out remain, if not worse, as a returnee. They cycle through. And it becomes a sort of petri dish to accelerate this entire process of, of social transformation, as you have this continuous cycling of people over and over through Mexico. And they can't necessarily go forward and stay, and they can't go back. Next, it's not just migrants who pass. Or criminals? Well, criminals pass as state authority in Mexico. The uniform of state police is actually a costume for criminal activity in many cases. And when a migrant approaches a police officer in Mexico, there's no telling what role that police officer is going to play, whether it's the one they're appropriately costumed for or another. So you have criminals passing as state authority across the country. And finally, I want to draw our attention to the ways that internal migration policing generate vul vulnerabilities for citizens. The, that boundary, that ambiguous boundary between foreigner and citizen, uh, as soon as you try to impose a fixed marker upon it, you're inevitably going to have false positives. And you're inevitably going to impinge upon the rights of the citizens that live along that sustained trade route. So in closing, I have one last map for you. I have others. If you want to visit me in, in Watson Institute, I'd gladly share the stories with you. Uh, but in this last map, I chose it because he uses these very happy and friendly national symbols to discuss his journey in the imagery. In Guatemala, you can see the indigenous, the indigenous pyramid. You can see the, the volcano, all sources of pride. He's actually from El Salvador. You have his volcano there. Um, and on to the United States, where you have the happy US flag. But as he drew this, he wept. He wept at the humiliation of the experience of detention in the United States, the deportation. And he wept because he'd never felt like a criminal until that had happened to him. And so the juxtaposition 
of these very happy national symbols and the man's experience is something worth um, studying for international relations scholars. And with that, I would like to say thank you and open it to questions.